Have you been struggling with your faith or have you been thinking about getting back into faith? We're going to talk about it today, but first, go to iTunes, subscribe to Cooper Stuff. Give me five stars if you dig it. Tell your friends about Cooper Stuff, by the way. Then we're going to jump right back into this, coming back to faith right here on Cooper Stuff. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Cooper Stuff. Okay, this week I put up uh, a thing on Instagram. I was asking what topics that you guys would like to talk about, and I got tons of great information. I can't wait. I got tons to dive into over the next, I don't know how many months we're going to deal with that. We'll find out soon, but I really loved reading that. Thank you so much for responding. One of the things I saw come up several times was people that say, hey, I've been struggling with my faith. What do you have to say about people that are uh, maybe trying to get back into faith or people that are like, yeah, maybe I really should start reading my Bible. Uh, what do I do? Things like that. This is a really hard subject that really we could take. We could we could really talk about this like every week <laughs> about various different aspects, I think, of, of losing faith and, and whatnot. Um, I, I want to talk about a few specific things that I hope will help people. Um one of the things that I do not want to talk about extensively this week is necessarily going to be grace. Now, the reason I want to talk about it this week is not because it's not important. It is actually the most important. I'm going to save that for another week because I have a friend coming on that's going to be a guest that is going to be way better to ask about grace than I could be. But I do want to say it in short because there are some people that that might need to hear this because this is like the most important thing I could say to anybody out there that says, hey, I'm a Christian. Um, maybe I stopped going to church or maybe I kind of still go to church, but I'm not really into it anymore. Maybe you are not into it at all anymore. I don't really know where you're at. I think the bedrock of what we have to build our foundation in Christ, okay, the foundation has to be grace. And what do I mean when I say grace? The foundation of this has to be that you cannot earn your salvation. This is like the great news of the gospel. You can't earn it. So it's not like if you do A, B, C, and D, then all of a sudden you're back in. You're, you know, you're back into Jesus. You're back into the kingdom. That's not how Christianity works. Uh, most of us know that. But it needs to be said on the front end because... What I want to talk to you about is going to be, I think, about some specific things that are more like mind battles about coming back into faith, things that I think trip us up. But it has to be on the bedrock that there is no condemnation for those in Christ. That's what the Bible says. In other words, God wants to accept you back into his kingdom, if you will. I think it's important to realize that you never left his kingdom in terms of a salvation if that makes sense. In other words, if you are saved by grace, you have been recreated in Christ, then you belong to him, okay? So it's not like, up, oh, you're out of the kingdom now, God has left you, and now you're kind of coming back. It's more of a position of the heart, and the more of a position of lordship, that you have not been acting in accordance with the fact that he is your lord. So I would say that the truth is, is that if you are saved and redeemed, then you belong to Christ. But maybe your life has not been consistent with that, okay? So we get into a lot of confusing things out there. So the, the bedrock of this has to be grace. The bedrock has to be God loves you. God accepts you. You have been for forgiven because of Jesus' work on the cross, not because you went to church this week, all right? Not because you read your Bible this week. Not because you decided to fast last month. I'm getting back into Jesus by fasting, and now that I've done something good, now God likes me again. It doesn't work like that. God loves you the same. It's what we call agape love in the Bible. He loves you because you belong to him. And no matter all the good deeds you could ever do, good, good, fasting, prayer, giving to the poor, reading your Bible, God doesn't love you more with each good thing that you do. That's an impossibility. God loves perfectly. On the flip side of the coin, God doesn't love you less because 
you know, you didn't read your Bible, didn't love people, didn't tithe, didn't help the poor. You know, it's not on a sliding scale. God's love is perfect. And if you belong to him, if you are a child of God, then, uh, then, then he loves you. And you are his child. You are royal, royalty to God because of what Christ did, not because of what you did. So that has to be the beginning of this. But I don't want to spend today's podcast talking about grace because truthfully, I'm not the guy to do that. Uh, I mean, I can talk about it, but there will be somebody that will be better at that. And that needs to be an entire conversation of the goodness of God. The greatness of knowing Jesus, the greatness of the gospel is all centered on grace. And that deserves its own entire podcast, okay? So today, I want you people to know the people that have hit me. A couple people have hit me and said, hey, I want to thank you. I've been struggling with my faith and Cooper stuff has helped me kind of reignite a little bit or maybe not reignite, but maybe just reinterest you into things of God. I love to hear that. That's why I'm here. And I hope that that does it that for a ton, a ton of people. Because living for Jesus is the only thing in this life that is fulfilling. And we're going to see it today. We're going to open up the Bible a little bit to talk about that. I also received several messages from people saying, Will you please talk about what it means to struggle with faith? Do something on that. So I do want to do that. So why do some of us struggle with our faith? First of all, to different degrees, all of us struggle with our faith. I would assume, I don't know every single person out there, I would have to assume that all of us have struggled with our faith at times. That doesn't make you a bad person. That doesn't make you like unique. Um, and, and, and what I mean is like alone, you're not alone in your faithlessness. I think probably that most Christians being honest would say, I have had faithless, faithless times with God. I have had times when I didn't want anything to do with him. I had times when I called him my Lord. Yeah, you're my Lord, but it was just something that I said. It wasn't the way that I lived and it began to gnaw at me and it began to be tough to live with. I think most people can, can feel that. So if that's you, Please don't feel that I think you're a bad person. Please don't feel condemned. Do not feel alone because there are people in the Bible uh, that struggle with with similar things. Okay, so that's okay. Some of the reasons that we struggle with this. uh, I want to say something to people, first of all. Uh, We're going to jump into Ecclesiastes in a second. But some people that really struggle with like th- th- this faith, it's like this pool of, they're so unfulfilled because they know they're not living for God in the way they should. I want to say this, that to a degree, I think you need to understand that if you have given your life to Christ, so if you have believed in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you have confessed with your mouth that he rose from the dead, if you believe that he is God, he is the only way to salvation. If you have been recreated in Christ, okay, then God has done something in your heart and he has made you to be a new creation. If you then stop pursuing God in the way that you live, the Bible calls it walking in the spirit sometimes, you may remember that. Um, I think walking in the spirit is a really good way to say it because if we are not walking in the spirit, then the Bible says that we walk in the flesh, okay? For the people who don't know Christ, they always walk in their flesh. That's what they do. They sin because that is their nature to do so. When we give our life to Christ, God calls us to walk in the Spirit. And if we are not walking in the Spirit, then we will by default walk in the flesh. Yes, we've been recreated. Yes, the power of sin is broken in our lives. Yes, God gave me a brand new heart. But if we're not walking in the Spirit, we will default to walking in the flesh because we still live in this body. This body is not redeemed. That's why we will get new bodies in the resurrection. This body is not redeemed, and this body is still prone to fleshly weakness, okay? Where I'm going with this is to say this. If you have been recreated with a brand new heart, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. The Holy Spirit is drawing you to himself. The Holy Spirit is drawing you to walk in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is drawing you to view God as supremely, uh, as Lord, as the ultimate supremacy in your life. 
And if you are ignoring the Holy Spirit, that is why you are living in a state of frustration. You're living in a state of frustration because you have a brand new heart, but it is telling you to do something that you are not doing. So I think that it needs to be recognized from Christians that if you are in a state of frustration, that is actually a really good thing. And I'll explain why. It's a really wonderful thing because in a sense, you will be more frustrated as a Christian that is not living for Jesus, as a Christian that is not walking in the Spirit, as a Christian that is saying no to the Holy Spirit when He is pulling you, you are living in probably in more frustration than someone who never knew Christ to start with. Now, it's still a better place to be because the good news is, is as we're going to see, is the Holy Spirit is faithful to you and He is drawing you to Himself. But I, there's an amazing Matthew Henry commentary that I read that was basically saying that if you are not living in obedience to God, then the, that rebellion will cause frustration in you because you are being disobedient. Everybody that doesn't know Christ is living in disobedience to God. Full time, ever since the day they were born, it is not their choice. They are living in disobedience. It's their choice to disobey God, but they are born into it. They are fulfilling a sinful nature. They are still frustrated, I believe, but not frustrated in the way that we will be when we are saying no to God. So we're going to jump into that in one second. Why do I say that people are living in frustration in general when they are not living for God? I want to read this. This is um, the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, some Christians don't love the book of Ecclesiastes. I used to be on your team. I used to hate the book of Ecclesiastes. I was like, what is this book even in the Bible for? It's so depressing. It's so dark. It's such a like grim look at what life is about. It is my wife's very favorite book of the Bible. Subsequently, I listened to a really long teaching on Ecclesiastes, like a two-month teaching on it from a guest a preacher that is going to be a guest on our show next week to talk about grace. And it blew me away. It opened my eyes to see how amazing this book of Ecclesiastes is. Ecclesiastes is written by the wisest person who ever lived. His name was Solomon. And listen to this thing. Solomon is basically saying this. What, what, what Ecclesiastes is most known for is that he always calls life vanity. And vanity doesn't mean in this sense... Uh, a lot of times we say vanity meaning like almost like arrogance, like, oh, that, that person's so vain. All they do is look at themselves in the mirror all the time. They're so full of themselves. Vanity in this sense means like nothingness. Have you ever heard uh, the phrase like it was a, a vain attempt at valor? In, in other words, uh, you know, you were struggling to win a war, to do something, and they say it was a vain attempt. In other words, it was empty, an empty attempt at something can be something that you could call vanity. In this sense, vanity means nothingness, incompleteness, uh, incompleteness, emptiness, absolute emptiness. And what Ecclesiastes is known for is this is that all is vanity. Everything in life is nothing. Everything in life is emptiness. And this entire book of Ecclesiastes is talking about Solomon's pursuit to find the meaning of life. And he, he looked for it in wine, and he's like, I tried to find it with being full of wine and debauchery, emptiness. So then I tried it uh, to, to live more like maybe like uh, the Buddhist would live or, or something like that, like Siddhartha, where I live for absolutely nothing. I do not taste any wine. I do not taste food. I live for, for, for uh, what you would say, the opposite of pleasure. It would be the lack of pleasure. So I live for the lack of pleasure and all it ended up with it was absolute nothingness. I live for money, nothingness. I live to be poor, nothingness, if you can see what I'm getting at. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, he says this, um, I applied my mind to examine and explore through wisdom all that is done under heaven. What a miserable existence that God has given us to keep us occupied. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun, and I have found everything to be futile, a pursuit of the wind. This is why we are so frustrated. God has put <clears throat> eternity in our hearts, okay? We long for eternity. <clears throat> why do we always feel 
that there is something more to life. We feel that way because there is something more to life. Why is it that we even when Hollywood, okay, the richest people in the world, they are the most beautiful people in the world, they have fame, they have glory, they have sex, they have money. Why do these people uh, literally kill themselves from suicide, from accidental overdoses, from, from uh, addiction? Why do all these things happen when they have amassed everything that we could ever possibly want in this life? It is because we are actually meant for something more than this world. And that's what it says in the Bible. God has put eternity in the hearts of men. That's the reason you feel dissatisfied. The reason you feel lonely. Because we were made for something more than this. And our home is not in these fleshly bodies. These bodies are rotting, okay? Ever since the day you were born, you are dying a little bit every day. You are meant for something greater than this. And that is in your heart. And it is driving us slowly and slowly more disappointed, more empty, okay? When we find Christ, all of a sudden we find joy, we find fulfillment, we find, oh, we find this wonderful thing called satisfaction, okay? I don't mean just being satisfied like drinking water when you're thirsty, a little bit like that, but it's a lot more than that. We find soul this soul, not S-O-L-E, S-O-U-L, we find soul satisfaction in Christ because for the Christian, we realize my life is not about living on earth. My life isn't about this fleshly body. My life is about a brand new heart. And now I have something to live for for all eternity. I have found my home. My home is in Christ, okay? For the Christian who finds their satisfaction in Jesus. They find their eternal home in Jesus, if you will, being um, a family member of God. We're children of God, the Bible says. When we decide not to live for that, it does something to us that is almost worse than, than, than never ha have had that sip of water. It's like drinking from, uh, from the ocean when you're thirsty. It's drinking salty water and it is leaving you actually thirsty than you were before. So why am I saying all of that? I'm saying all that because a lot of Christians say, I'm struggling with my faith. I don't know how to get back into it. I want to say to you that the reason you are struggling in your faith is actually a goodness of God. And let me explain why. It's a goodness of God that is not giving up on you. It is a goodness of God that says, hey, hey listen to me. Listen to me. I am the Holy Spirit. And I am speaking to you because I live inside of you. I'm the one that's drawing you. And if I have to draw you into dissatisfaction with your life in order for you to reach out to me for satisfaction, then that is what I will do. It's not really all that different than parenting. Sometimes in parenting, you know what is good for your kids, but your kids, all that they want is ice cream. <laughs> And you're like, no, no, I know what is good for you, okay? It's not ice cream. You actually need, like, food. You need sustenance for your body. Or ice cream is going to actually make you sick. So I know what is good for you. So I am withholding ice cream from you on purpose for you to allow me to do something that is good for you that will, you will enjoy more than you will enjoy the ice cream, if you will, okay? It's not totally unlike what we do as parents. So it's actually a grace of God because God is faithful to you. A lot Christians, if you're struggling with your faith, please listen to me when I say this, that we talk about the faithfulness of God for a reason, okay? It's not just that God is faithful to you because it sounds good in a song. It's not just that God is faithful to you because we say, he's so faithful because he loves me. I mean, yes, he's faithful because he loves you, but there's an actual outworking of faithfulness that can be difficult for you and me, but it's actually extremely beautiful. God is a God of faithfulness. We know this from the Old Testament. God gives us names of who he is so we can understand his faithfulness. Listen to me. Christians who are struggling with your faith, listen to this. God is a covenant God, okay? Covenant, he has made a promise with you. And he is not a human being, meaning when he makes a promise, he keeps a promise. He's not human. 
He's not like humans that say, I make a promise to my wife to always love her. Yeah, we got divorced because I changed my mind later. Things change. God doesn't change. He makes a promise for you. And listen, I want to say something so beautiful about a covenant God, okay? He is a God that wants us to know that he is faithful because he makes a promise. But I got to split hairs here because it's such a beautiful picture of God. He's also a God who has the power to keep his promise. Now, some people might say, what's the difference between those things? It's actually different. Think about it like this. God did not have to make a promise with you, but he chose to do that because he's good. So we worship him because he's a covenant God. But we also should understand that he's not just a God that makes a promise. He's a God who has ultimate power to keep the promise. Those are actually two slightly different things. Okay? He has the power to keep it. And it is precisely the faithfulness of God that is drawing you, the Christian who isn't in a right relationship maybe with God, he is drawing you to dissatisfaction for a purpose. The Bible says it is the goodness of God that draws us to repentance. Does that make sense? He is bringing you to a place of dissatisfaction because he wants you to realize that without God, everything is vanity. Without God, everything is emptiness. And you, Christian, are going to be more miserable if you are saying no to the Holy Spirit. If you are not walking in the Spirit and you are walking in your flesh, then what that means is that you are living in rebellion to a new nature that you have. Isn't that amazing? That's the reason you're so frustrated. So you say, yeah, but what do I do about that? What you do about that is realize the privilege it is that this God of the universe knows you by name. This God of the universe called you by name and wait for it, not because you were good, not because you did good stuff, not because you deserved it. He knew your name before you were ever created. He knew your name before the world even was created. He knew you and called you before then. Isn't that amazing? That's what the Bible says. He foreknew you before the foundations of the world were even created. This is an amazing thing because all of a sudden the pressure is off of you to be good enough, which is good because you cannot be good enough, okay? It's grace. The great news is that if you will find yourself amazed at the goodness of a God who knew you before the world was ever created, who wanted you for his own before the world was ever created, who sent his Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is God, by the way, he sent the Holy Spirit in your life to make himself so good to you that you could not resist him, that you could not, your eyes were open, your eyes were open to see you could not not see God everywhere that you looked to believe in his existence, to find satisfaction in him, and to continue that work in your life now because he wants you. If you can open your eyes to realize what a privilege it is to know that God, I believe that you will fall madly, desperately in love with Jesus all over again because he is not going to give up on pursuing you. Why? because you belong to him. Why do you belong to him? Because he chose for you to belong to him. That's the reason that he is pursuing you so. So if you're struggling with your faith, I would like to ask you to realize the great privilege, not everybody sees this by the way, the great privilege it is to realize that this life is not about pleasure. This life is not about you finding satisfaction in whatever the world has to offer. This life is not about finding a God that will please me. This life is about finding a God who allows me to please him. It's amazing. It is the best, tastiest revelation in my life to realize that I exist to bring God pleasure. And if I can have a right mind every day that says, God, today I live not for myself, Today I live to bring you pleasure. And what an honor it is that the King of Glory would allow someone like me with all of my flaws, with all of my weaknesses, with all of my selfishness, with how prone I am to stray and to not want to walk in the Spirit, how prone I am to want to walk in my flesh, 
that that King of Glory allows me to be a son, to be an heir of the throne of Christ, to be a, an adopted sibling of Christ, to be the righteousness of Christ, that he allows me to please him, to be an object of his affection, someone that was an adulterer like me, an adulterer to God I'm talking about. I've loved other gods. I've loved myself. I've loved my own self-satisfaction. I've loved my own self-righteousness. That that God allows me to be an object of his affection. To me, that diminishes all of my flesh. If I can remind myself of that every day, I go, you know what? Today is not about me. Today is about pleasing Christ with my actions. That might be a little bit more cerebral than some people were hoping for. Some people might want to hear stories of my life and how I came back to faith. But the truth is, that is what keeps me going every day. That I get to have something that I could never earn and never deserve as a child of God, as a son of God, as an adopted sibling of Christ is almost too good to imagine. So for all you Christians in your faith out there, if you're struggling, if you're thinking, I don't really know if I want to come back, I want to say this, you are going to continue to be in a life of frustration because you have actually tasted and seen the goodness of God, yet you are choosing not to walk in it. And the Holy Spirit is going to do his job. And his job is to bring you into a back to a place of satisfaction in Christ alone. And until you come to that, the Holy Spirit is going to be speaking and speaking and you are going to become increasingly more dissatisfied, increasingly more frustrated, increasingly more alone because it is the goodness of God that draws you to repentance. So my encouragement to you, give up the fight because the Holy Spirit is going to win the fight. And then when he does, your life is going to be so much better and so much richer because your joy will be found in Christ alone. Hope you enjoyed it. I hope it helps. Next week, we're going to talk about grace, how amazing grace is, and I hope that it just sets you on fire for Jesus, all right? Thank you so much. Go out there, have a great week, and thank God that you get to know him. Mm, mm, hallelujah! Woo.